in the um, new covenant stage of the first cycle where the uh, names of the children are given uh, their reverse significance in order to depict the blessings of the, the new covenant. As we said, uh, this uh, uh, it comes abruptly, except that it has been anticipated uh, back in verse 7 by what was there said about Judah. And, uh, and uh, incidentally, what is there promised about Judah, that God is going to save them and, and so on. Uh, the meaning of that, I don't think, is that merely that Judah is going to be spared there in the 8th century from the exile, and it was only the northern kingdom was going into Ezra. The exile and not Judah. I don't think that's the, the point of Israel, that Judah is being saved. Nor do I think the point uh, of, of this uh, is that, that they, when the restoration from Old Testament exile took place from Babylon, uh, that it was primarily the, the tribe of Judah is over against the northern tribes that was brought back. I don't think that's the reference. I, I think definitely the verse 7 is referring to what you get down here again in chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. Uh, namely, uh, that in, in the line of Judah, the Messiah would come forth and that there would be the, the ultimate uh, salvation of the new covenant uh, that would be experienced. Well, uh, that is what is being described here now. And so Jezreel's uh, name will come true in, in the, the, the multiplying of the covenant community through the incoming uh, of uh, the, the Gentiles. And, and uh, that was uh, verse 1. And uh, then we were getting the, the, the ideal nature of the New Covenant as, as, as correcting the divisiveness of the Old Testament with its division into northern and, and, and southern kingdoms and, uh, you know, the, the, the uh, ultimate uh, ideal of the New Covenant is the union of the, the many members and the, the one body of, of uh, Christ. And, uh, and that's described then in terms of of the, 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 the days when, uh, before the system and, and uh, the departure of Israel, when Israel and Judah were dwelling together, as it says, and they shall make for themselves, uh, continuing now there with verse 2, where we were reading, they will make for themselves Rosh, Rosh Echad, one, one head, one, one leader, and, uh, <coughs> well, what point in, in history, what one leader would be in, in view? Is it looking back to the days when Moses was the, the, the leader of all of them? Uh, or is it uh, looking back uh, especially to the days of David uh, and uh, the Davidic monarchy and the days of David and Solomon be, before the uh, division? Those are both possibilities. They will make for themselves, of course, just one head. Now, when you move along to the, the third cycle and you look to the fifth verse there in chapter 3 this idea of, of the one head is identified in terms of the figure they will, they, they will return unto the Lord their God and unto David their king and uh, so that, that's the typology I guess that's in view here with the one head it's, it's Christ the one head the head of the body uh, the, the, the church the, the king in the line of uh, David and they will make for themselves one head. Now, other prophetic idiom from uh, the Old Testament, and Alu, they shall go up from the land, and for great will be the day of, of Jezreel. Now, the expression, they will go up from the land, has uh, been given a variety of uh, interpretations. They will go up from the land, uh, the Israelites, annually went up from the land up to Jerusalem. Huh? They went up to Jerusalem on their tributary pilgrimages uh, uh, at the annual feasts. Uh, another suggestion has been uh, uh, taking a, a, a cue from the account of the uh, uh, coronation of David when, when all of the tribes <coughs> together went up from all over the land in order to anoint David king over them. Uh, another idea is that they, they go up in the exodus from the land of Egypt. So it's, it's a question of which point in this total history of Israel is being referred to what going up from what land is in view. So they're going up from the land of Egypt was another one. And <coughs> in favor of this one, if you looked ahead as a trust you have, you remember that <coughs> uh, when this expression occurs again a little 
later on, it, it actually specifies what, what, when they will go up from, from Egypt. So uh, that argues in, in, in favor of, of that alternative, uh, the, the, the departure of the Israelites as, a, as an escape from uh, the, the land of Egypt, and they're going up from there to the, the uh, promised land. Uh, this same expression is, is used in the, the Exodus narratives to express the fear of the, the, the Pharaoh and so on, that there will be a revolt on the part of, of uh, the Hebrew slaves and that, that, that they will go up, uh, rise up and revolt uh, from the land. So that's an, another uh, the thought, a sort of a military conquest rising up. Uh, just to mention a couple of other views of the thing, the word Eretz, land, is uh, used for the thought of the, the underworld, the, the grave. And uh, this is not all that uncommon. Uh, and uh, the thought would be that of resurrection, uh, according to uh, this view, there will be a rising up uh, from death to life. And uh, somewhat in, uh, along that line, uh, to just the very natural idiom of, of plants growing up from the ground, the sprouting up, the sprouting up of the people of God, uh, you know, the, uh, out of, out of the, the earth. So uh, the, those are some of the suggestions. There's probably others, and uh, look them over, take your choice. <laughs> and, uh, but some aspect of Old Testament history, uh, of the thought of exaltation and elevation from lowly to highly uh, situation is, uh, is in view, and, and this associated with the name of Jezreel, which is uh, promising this kind of uh, restoration from diminution. And then verse uh, 3, continuing the uh, playing on the names, uh, says, Yes, uh, say to your brothers you are, who had been low on me, you are now my people again. Hmm? And uh, say to your sisters who had been low Ruhama that uh, now uh, she does uh, have, have uh, mercy. All right. So uh, the, there is the end of the first cycle, verse uh, four in your Hebrew text of uh, chapter two, uh, begins the the uh, second cycle, and once again it will have these three uh, sections. And uh, let me suggest a little outline that might be helpful. In the A section will be verses, um, this is working there, huh? So the, the, <coughs> the A section will be verses 4 through 7. <coughs> and here we, we have God's complaint, his indictment, which is at the same time something of a warning uh, of what is going to happen. Uh, but with the primary emphasis on the indictment and uh, the, the word their sin's going to lead them gets woven in, but the, the, the primary focus in the A section is on the, the indictment rather than the, the, the punitive outcome. But then in verses 8 through uh, 15, uh, the primary emphasis is on the, the actual threat of judgment. And once again, while dealing with the, the judgment, uh, there is reflecting back on the cause of it. Uh, uh, but this time, the, the, the emphasis is not on the sin uh, that causes it, but it's on the, the judgment uh, that results in it, uh, that results from it. And then uh, the, the final section uh, will be uh, verses 16 through 25. Breaking this down just a little bit more, the middle section, the B section, uh, is subdivided, especially by the appearance of the word lachain. Uh, noodle paragraphs are signalized uh, by this term lachain, which means uh, not just therefore, but verily, verily. Uh, uh, a strong affirmation uh, at the beginning of, uh, of some assertion or other. And uh, following that clue, we uh, divide the <coughs> verses 8 through 15 first into verses 8 through 10 and then into 11 through 15 and uh, verses 8 through 10 now mind you this is the, the threat, threat of judgment judgments being described and uh, verses 8 through 10 describe uh, the, the judgment uh, that, that they will be uh, uh, 
prevented uh, from engaging uh, further in, uh, in, the, in their Baal cult. That's been their sin, that they've forsaken the Lord and they've uh, been indulging in the cult of, of Baal. And so as punishment, uh, there will be the removal of Baalism from them in, 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 that, uh, in, in the sense of purifying them. That will be its meaning uh, 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 subsequently. But at this point, the removal of Baalism is a matter of frustration for them. They, they just want to go and take part in all these uh, great uh, cultic festivals. Uh, and uh, God's going to, by putting them in exile, cut them off from, uh, from what was going on in that, that fertility cult there in, uh, in Canaan. And so it will be a matter of frustration to them uh, that, that there is a removal of, of Baalism. And then in verses 11 through 15, it's the removal of prosperity. So the removal of Baalism as a matter of frustration, and then the removal of, of prosperity. And this is, of course, a good illustration of what the exile was all about. Both of those sections introduced, as I say, by Lacan. Now, the next time you encounter the uh, Lacan, it's uh, introducing the restoration passage, uh, the, the new covenant passage in verses uh, 16 and following, uh, which also then un unfolds uh, verses 16 through 20, if we want to subdivide it, and then verses 21 through 25. with the verses uh, 16 through uh, 20 describing uh, the new courtship and the new marriage uh, where God will court Israel in the wilderness and he will be wed to her in purity. And so here, in connection with the blessings of the new covenant, we once again have the thought of the removal of Baalism, the removal of Baalism, but this time not as a matter of frustrating them and what they want to do, in their sinfulness, but this time in the sense of uh, their sanctification, the removal of idolatry, the, it's a matter of not a frustration, but a purification to them as, as a blessing of the new covenant, this, uh, this uh, removal of Baalism. Uh, and then the reversal of uh, the removal of prosperity, which was dealt with in the 11 uh, through 15 verses, is the restoration of prosperity. So just like the names get complete reversals, uh, so these particular features of their exile uh, get reversed in terms of the New Covenant blessings. And then verses 21 through 25, now sing, uh, signalized not by the, the word la Cain, but by the, the triple repetition of the uh, word erashtika, which, which has to do with the the betrothal. I, I will betroth you to myself. Yes, I will betroth you to myself. So here is the, this, this, the triple affirmation of the new marriage, the Christ and, and his, his uh, people, verses 21 through 25. So that's the structure of the passage overall. And uh, now let's uh, look at some of the detailing in it. Uh, chapter 2, verse 4. Well, this is beyond the part where I guess uh, you had required reading. The required reading was chapter 1, wasn't it, and chapter 3, uh, but not uh, chapter 2. But, so, but nevertheless, follow along in, in your Hebrew text. Yeah. It begins with the lawsuit, reeve, huh? Contend on, on it's in the verbal form here, reeve. Contend, enter into the lawsuit with your mother. Yes, uh, yes, uh, revi, content. And uh, so here we are at the, the stage of the indictment, the lawsuit, which uh, brings to their attention uh, their, their breaking of the uh, covenant. So the, the children are now being asked uh, as, uh, to take the place in court against the, their mother. So contend now against your mother, contend. Ki he lo is she. Now how to read this? Uh, uh, this, as I said, is the, the indictment. It's the, the threat of judgment here, not so much the actual uh, account of the execution of the judgment. And so I hesitate to translate, contend with your mother, contend to the effect that she is no longer my wife, as if the divorce uh, were already affected, uh, perhaps something more in the way of a, a, of a future, a, a threat. Contend with your mother, that, that she will not be my wife, huh? that the, the husband-wife relationship is in, in, in jeopardy, and that, that she will not be 
my wife and Anoki, lo isha, and I will not be her husband. Notice the use of these words like, like ish, not just for a man in general, but a husband specifically. And I will not be to her her husband. A, a, a separation, an exile, or a rupture of the covenant will take place. And uh, the next word, what taser, then I would take more as, as an exhortation. So bring this to her to her attention, the, 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 the threat that separation, divorce uh -huh. is imminent, and let her turn aside as if it were, you, you know, still possible, possibly it, uh, to avoid this, and let her turn aside her whoredoms from her face and her adulteries from between her breasts. Let her stop engaging in, in this uh, uh, faithlessness, lest, now that, that is uh, what I think is significant at the beginning of verse 5, and which uh, gives the, the tone of, of uh, exhortation and, and threat rather than total execution to this particular section. Let her think on this, let her amend her ways, lest this calamity overtake her. What is the calamity? Namely, from the verb pashat, which means to, to strip away. So lest I, I, I strip her <coughs> naked, aruma, lest I strip her naked. And then the next verb is uh, a peyod verb, yatsag. And lest I set her forth as in the day iwalada, is a nifal, uh, an infinitive uh, construct from yalad, yalad uh, to bear, and nifal to be born. Uh, and so lest I set her forth naked as in the day that uh, she was, was born. And uh, going on, and with, with the threat, and and I will set her like a wilderness. This is what will overtake her in the way her covenant breaking. Uh, I will, from the verb seen, samtiha. I will set her. I will make her. I will turn her into a midbar. Now, wilderness here is the place of uh, desolation and, and death, rather clearly. And continuing with, with that kind of imagery, uh, uh, sort of the realm of nature, Im impersonal uh, symbols, and now from the verb sheath, uh, the first was from seam, now from the verb sheath, you get, and lest I should set her like a desert land, a parched, dry, fruitless place, and then the imagery changes from the desert land to the, the person who is wandering and, and dying of thirst in, in, in the desert, as it says, and, and lest I should slay her, that's the verb moot, to die, hithiel, uh, Bob consecutive, lest I should put her to death there from thirst. So here, here are the threats uh, that will, of uh, the judgment that will follow upon covenant uh, breaking. Moreover, and now we get the, the reference to the names again of the children. And uh, upon her children, verse 6, uh, two more verses in this uh, first A section. And upon her children, I will not have pity, for they are bene zinunim. Now remember what I said earlier on, uh, that uh, one of the indications uh, that the second and the third child, and Bo Ruhama, the second one has just been referred to, one of the indications that the second and the third uh, children are, are not Hosea's uh, is that here in this second cycle, it is immediately uh, conjoined to the names of the, the second and third children that we have the explicit reference to the, the shameful behavior of, of their mother. And, uh, and so having said, uh, I, I will have not have pity for they are, they are children of, of whoredoms the explanation is, is given. Why are these children called children of whoredoms? Verse 7, because their mother has been unfaithful. She has committed harlotry. And repeating the thought, it uses the, uh, the verb hara to conceive, and it presents the, the, the cal active participle, uh, horatham, the one who conceived, she who conceived them, horatham. And then the verb right in front of that, uh, ho the sha is from the verb bosh, which means to act shamefully. So these children are, are, are children of are their yalde zinunim because the mother has been guilty of zana, whoredom. The one who conceived them has acted shamefully. And uh, now her shameful action, of course, 
is that she has deserted her husband and, and gone after her lovers. Uh, for she said, I will go after my lovers. And she attributes to her, her lovers the provisions that she has been en enjoying all this time. She identifies her lovers uh, as, the, as literally the givers of, huh? the character participle, uh, construct plural. The givers of my bread and my water, zamri, or pishti, and my, my wool and my flax, uh, and also m my oil and my drink. And so she lists all of these things uh, that her husband has been providing her with, uh, and she attributes them uh, not to him. Israel doesn't attribute all these good gifts of the promised land to God. She, she ups and perversely attributes uh, the, them to Baal as though she'd gotten them uh, from Baal. Now, a series of things are, are listed which has uh, um, prompted a, a, a attention of the fact that in, there are legal documents from the Near East that describe the, the, a, a sort of a triad of commodities, a sort of a stereotype standard list of, of uh, three things, uh, three items uh, that uh, are to be provided uh, uh, by husbands for various uh, secondary wives, which are, are are classified, but they are what is required then, then in, uh, to fulfill husbandly responsibilities uh, toward these particular wives of various kinds is uh, food, clothing, and oil. Uh, these three: food, clothing, and and, and oil uh, are not to be denied. Whatever other the, the things uh, it might. Uh, be and so food and clothing are more obvious, but but the oil uh, with uh, many uses. Uh, so uh, uh, the the oil uh, would, would uh, uh, be you know a medical insurance policy. Hmm? The, the the use of oil for anointing wounds and so on. So her the, the provisions of health uh, met by the supply of oil or the cosmetic uh, use uh, of of uh, oil for the uh, treatment of the skin and the, the, the dry, parched uh, uh, climates and so on. In addition to uh, the, the one more in our minds nowadays, the, the oil as fuel huh, for, for whatnot, for energy. But uh, the, the, the oil then was a commodity, not to, to, to be treated lightly. It was a big necessity and so it's, it's uh, added with the food and, and uh, clothing. And uh, there's a uh, passage in, uh, where is it, in Leviticus or, or somewhere where, where once again it is speaking about a, the, the same situation of, of that which must be done for a, 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 a wife, uh, a, some sort of secondary wife, and it's, it's food and clothing. And then the, the third item that's mentioned is a rare word, oh now, which is often rendered marital uh, privileges. And, and so uh, uh, th that would be the, the third item, but in the light of the, the sort of the standard triad of commodities in the Near Eastern legal text for dealing with this kind of situation, I think it's more likely that that third ingredient we don't know how to translate in, in the Bible might also be uh, some term suggestive of, of uh, oil. But in any case, uh, this is what a husband would uh, provide uh, for his people. This is what the Lord provided uh, for Israel. This is what Hosea had been providing for uh, Gomer. And, uh, but in each case, uh, the, then the, these uh, husbandly uh, provisions, <laughs> you know, are, it, it, are attributed to others outside, totally uh, perverse, uh, lack of gra gratitude, and, and, and so on. So, uh, I will go after my lovers. They're the ones who have been giving me all, all of these things. And uh, so that's uh, the way then in which this uh, first section closes. This is their sin. This is their sin. Their, their idolatry, their forsaking of the Lord. Now then, the, the next verses emphasize the punishment that will befall them. And it begins, as you notice, with that wor word, lachain, therefore now. This is what's going to result. The result, I'm going to go forth and judge them. The divine husband will uh, do this. Uh, therefore, behold, I am, and now you have the verb suk, which means to set up a hedge. Uh, and it's uh, the part as well. Behold, I am about to hedge up their ways with thorns. Now, remember the thought here is the removal of Baalism. That they just love to go to the, the, the licentious uh, cultic rituals and the festifications associated with uh, uh, Baal. And God's going to block the way. Uh, and so I'm going to set up a hedge and, uh, and uh, against their way with, with thorns. 
and uh, then the language of a wall with the verb and the cognate the na and I will build up a, a wall against her the pronominal suffix on the word for wall good day ra being uh, you know with the sense of against rather than the possessive I will build up against her a, a wall and the result will be that uh, she will not be able to find her paths her paths down the, the, the trail to the uh, Baal cult and verse 9 and she will thus pursue her lovers. She'll still want to go after her false gods, but she won't be able to overtake them anymore. God will frustrate her in, in this desire. They'll be taken to exile far away from the, the land of Canaan and the, the cult of Baal there. She will not be able to overtake them. She will seek them, but she won't find them. And now we have an interesting statement that, that uh, you know, it might sound something as if she's like the prodigal who in the far country comes to her senses and it comes back, but I don't think that's really what is in view, that there's genuine repentance and so on. It's just a sort of a self-pity of how badly off uh, she is here in exile. And she will say then, cut off from all of these things, I will go and I will return, L-E-C, unto my husband, Harishon, the first, or temporal, as it was at the first. The question here is whether the Hari Shon now is describing Ish, the husband, as, uh, as her first husband, because now she has gone and taken a second husband, or whether she's just describing an earlier situation when she was with her husband, as over against her present situation, whatever that is, but not necessarily implying that there's been a second uh, husband. So how you take this uh, will uh, determine in part uh, how you see the the separation too of uh, of uh, Hosea and, and and Gomer as to uh, whether in, in you know because you're going to have to make the parallel between God and Israel and, 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 and Hosea and Gomer. So if this is describing a situation involving a first husband and a second husband. Then uh, we will have to uh, assume that uh, Gomer was actually then separated and apparently divorced uh, from uh, uh, from Hosea, and that that she had entered into some sort of a a, a second marriage. But not necessarily the, is, is that the way to take it. As if if uh, Hari Shon meant her first husband is over against the second. As I said, it might also just be adverbial. She's describing the two situations then and now. And as a matter of fact, look on to the, the next clause, which is temporal, because he says, I was better off as meata, I was better off then than now. So that may be the, the clue as to the force of the Harishon. Then, at the beginning, as over against my present situation, and then there wouldn't be an, a necessary implication of a, a second husband uh, having been uh, involved. But, uh, but she does recognize that she's no, she's no longer off, uh, he's no longer in as good a shape as she was before. And as I say, I, I don't think this is sort of an Old Testament prodigal son uh, 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 correspond. And I, I think it's just that she is uh, recognizing that, that things aren't going well and she's sorry for herself. Verse 10, uh, underscoring again the sin that, that will lead up to this. Uh, uh, punishment. She did not yada. Or yada, you all know, means to know. Uh, but it also w would have the, the stronger force of to acknowledge, not just to know in your head, but to give expression to it and make an acknowledgement of. And uh, that's a, a sh the force that we need here. For she did not acknowledge. She would not acknowledge that I was the one hmm, who gave her all of these things. She said, these are the gifts of my lovers. Her sin was her turning her back on and being gratitude on the Lord. She would not acknowledge that I was the one who gave to her the grain, the Dagon and the Tirosh and the Yitzhar, the grain and the wine and the oil. That I was the one who multiplied the Kesef to her, Kesef here Beiti La. She wouldn't admit the truth about this, that the Lord God was the one who provided her with the kesef, the silver, and also the zahav, the gold, and uh, you must supply the relative pronoun, as often in poetry the relative pronoun is omitted, the gold, as, share, let's assume, which she actually, now you have the verb, 
asu from asa, which you know means to do or to make, but uh, which uh, also has the, the, the force of to use something for a purpose. Now here it's talking about the silver and the gold, uh, which the Lord gave her and which she used, uh, not as an expression of, of gratitude to the Lord, but which she made use of, le ba'al, for, for Baal. So she took God's good gifts and she, she dedicated, dedicated them in the Baal cult to the, to the glory of uh, uh, Baal. And uh, so that finishes this first section, eight uh, through 10, which was the, the uh, removal of, of Baalism, the opportunity to engage in it as a matter of frustration. Now verses 11 through 15, we'll have the second act of judgment, which is the removal of uh, all kinds of, of prosperity and blessings that attended their presence in the promised land of, of Canaan. So Lachain, once again, verily, verily, uh, this is what I will do. I will turn and I will take the grain in its season and, 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 and uh, are in its time, huh? And the wine in its season. All, all of these uh, gifts of the harvest that the Lord had provided, when, it, when the harvest would be due, they won't be there anymore. So I will take back the, the grain in its time and, and the wine in its season. And hit salty, the next verb, hit salty from the pay nun verb, not sal, which means positively to rescue, but negatively to snatch away, huh? And here it's the negative, is it not? And I will snatch away from her the wool and, and uh, the um, linen and, and uh, the, the, the I mean, and which was, here's another place where you have to supply the relative uh, pronoun. God had provided the wool and the flax, the linen uh, for her clothing. And so I will take back the, all of these products, so the wool and the, and the flax, asher de kasot, which was to have been a covering, pl infinitive construct from kasa, which was to have been a, a covering over her nakedness. She will no longer be getting those as gifts from the Lord. And uh, now, instead of providing a covering for her, I will expose <coughs> her, her, her nakedness. And verse uh, 12, and uh, now I, I will expose her lewdness before the eyes of, of her lovers. And uh, now here you get a, a feature that I think when we were looking at those uh, uh, lawsuit speeches in the, the book of Judges by the angel of the Lord, we, we uh, noted uh, that uh, often it will be uh, pointed out that when the Lord enters into judgment, uh, the, 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 there's no point in, in looking anywhere else for help because no one's gonna be able to deliver out of God's hand. And uh, that's the, the rhetorical item that is inserted here. And ish, lo, there's, there's not a, a man anywhere who will be able, and, and now we get that same verb, not sal, that we just spoke about, that God will snatch away these things. It's now it's used in the positive sense of rescue, but with the negative, not will they, anyone be able to deliver you from my hand. When, when the, I go into action to execute the covenant curse, the, the, there will be no de deliverance uh, from my hand. And spelling out the, the, uh, the, the threat, he now uses that verb Shabbat. Earlier on, we saw that we had the verb Shabbat, punning on it uh, to, uh, to uh, indicate the end of the kingdom. And uh, now the verb Shabbat is used again with that sense of bringing something to an end, an unhappy end, a cessation. And, uh, and here the object is uh, all of the joyous occasions. Uh, all of the happy festive uh, occasions that had marked life in Canaan in, in exile will be gone no more. So uh, uh, I will cause to cease uh, uh, all such joyous occasion, which is then broken down into the yearly, the monthly, and the weekly, hmm? the, the, the festival occasions, the, the annual festivals, Haga, the monthly uh, occasions, uh, the, the, the Hadashah, and then the weekly occasion, the Sabbath itself. So I will cause to cease all festival occasions there, the, the annual, the monthly, and the weekly Sabbath. So as I uh, said, you get the pun of, of Sabbathizing the, the Sabbath uh, uh, itself. And then summing all these things up again, it has uh, all of her appointed festivals. All of these things will be made uh, to cease. And continuing the thought, uh, now from the verb uh, shamam, to make desolate, and I will make desolate her vine and her fig, which she said was the higher 
the, the, these things are to me which my lovers gave to me. The, that thought again of her false attribution of all of these things to her lovers. Uh, God will make them desolate. And uh, moreover, he says, I will turn these uh, fruitful fields and so on. And now the verb is seen. I will set them, I will place them uh, like, like thickets, like the thick woods uh, in, instead of a, a, a fruitful field. And uh, moreover, the, the beasts of the field will, will devour them. Verse 15, uh, let's uh, see, this is the, the last verse then in this uh, uh, thread of judgment. And uh, I will visit upon you. Here's that verb pakad again, which we had earlier in the, in the sense of to visit judgment upon you. I will visit upon you the, the, the days of, uh, of Jay, who was it? And uh, I will visit upon you. Here's the days of Baal. What are the days of Baal? Well, the festive days, the, the, uh, the, the cultic occasions of Baal, of the Baalim, which you uh, poured out incense to them, and Tahad, and you arrayed yourself, you decked yourself out with rings and with jewels, this is how they engaged in the cult, and you went after your lovers, and me, you forgot, Neum Yahweh, and uh, that's why all this calamity will be falling. So there is the, the old covenant, uh, the breaking of it, the curses of exile that will befall them. Now we uh, move on uh, to the new covenant stage. With verse 16, and it too begins with that verb, la king, new paragraph. And this extends on through the rest of the chapter, so it is quite a lengthy one, the, this uh, C portion, verses 16 through 25. Once again, moving abruptly beyond uh, the exile thought uh, to the thought of the new, new covenant. Verily, behold, I am about mipateha to persuade you, to, to woo you, to <coughs> allure you. The picture is of, of God wooing the new bride to, to himself, uh, and uh, the verb is pata. We discussed another rare root pata when we were uh, doing Noah's oracle, and uh, the thought, may, may God open it. There was a verb pata, which we said should probably be translated, may God open wide the, the tent flaps uh, for the Japhethites to come in. Now there is a second uh, root pata, which has the, the, the force of to coax someone to do something, to persuade them to do something. Uh, in, in this connection of, 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 of wooing a wife uh, to, to allure her. And so, behold, I, I am alluring her, and, and uh, I, I will bring her forth, the hippial form from Hala, uh, Hala, I will bring her forth into the, the wilderness, and I will speak literally unto her heart. What's the imagery? Okay, now remember when we're in this section, we're interested in prophetic idiom. We're seeing how all kinds of events in the Old Testament history are, are, are laid hold of to depict the, 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 the blessings and the glories of the New Covenant. Which one is this? What, what Old Testament uh, uh, episode is in, in, in view here? I will bring her forth into the wilderness and uh, I will speak unto her heart. I will speak tenderly to her. Just a, a couple of comments. Uh, uh, first, on, on that second point, I will speak unto her heart. What, what does that mean? If you look up in Judges 19, verses 1 through 3, you get a good illustration of the force of this idiom. Uh, and this is where the Levite, uh, uh, whose uh, wife has gone back to her father, mm -hmm. goes after her and, uh, and is trying to persuade her to come back with him, which eventually he succeeds in doing, but with very tragic results. But meanwhile, he, he comes to her, and, and, he, he, and this is the expression, he spoke unto her heart. He tried to persuade her of why she should come with him. Well, here the Lord is doing it to, to his bride. He, he is, be reconciled to me, come, come uh, with me. Uh, and it's in the wilderness. I will bring her forth into the wilderness. Now, just above the wilderness was used as a as an image of, of, of desolation and so on. I will slay her with thirst there and then I will turn her into a parched wilderness. Now that doesn't seem to be the force of the, the, the wilderness here. And uh, the wilderness is uh, the place to which the Israelites went uh, 
uh, as they went out of Egypt in order to go to the mountain of God, huh? To serve him there and to enter into the great covenant assembly uh, at Sinai uh, there in the wilderness. And so I think that's the force of it here. I will bring her to the place of trysting, of, of, of engagement, of covenanting together in, in, in marriage. And uh, so I think that's where our thoughts should, should be. It's at the, the exodus, exodus to Sinai, to, to the place of, of covenant making in, in the wilderness. And then it goes on in, in uh, verse uh, uh, 17 and says, and, and I will give to her, under the new covenant now, uh, I, I will give to her her vineyards right from there. And uh, the new covenant will be a place where even what had been a, a, an occasion or a place or, uh, of difficulty in the Old Testament is turned in, in, into its opposite here under the new. Now, the wilderness, although it was the place of, of the covenant making at Sinai, was indeed, uh, you know, not the land flowing with milk and honey. And uh, the spies uh, bring uh, back uh, two of the people in the wilderness, the, the signs of the big grape clusters and so on. That's the way life is going to be once you get into the land, uh, lots of fine grapes and so on. And not yet in the journey between uh, uh, Egypt and uh, the promised land. But under the new covenant, even the, the, the place which would have been a, a place of, of where you're still longing for fruitfulness, you already have your vineyards. You don't have to go up and, and cross the Jordan in order to, to get the, the blessings. So I will give to her her vineyards even from there, from the wilderness. And then there was that other thing that happened in the wilderness at the Valley of Achor, which itself means troubling, the Valley of Troubling. But it's especially where Achan uh, sinned and was punished along with his, his family. It was a, the Valley of Achor was a place of uh, of severe judgment against the, the, the covenant uh, breakers. But in the complete reversal of things under the new covenant, uh, even the, the act of divine judgment becomes the occasion of the source, the foundation of, of blessing. And of course, we're thinking of the cross. And, and, and so uh, in the New Testament, Calvary is, is the place of, 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 of judgment, but it's uh, where the judgment is visited on vicariously on another in behalf of uh, God's people. And so even the 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 the, 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 Akor, the valley of Achor, will be a petak tikva, will be a door of hope. Calvary would seem the end of, of the road and, and judgment, but lo and behold, it turns into be the, the hope, uh, the, the entryway, the, the gate to heaven, uh, the, 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 the gate of the eternal hope for God's people, complete reversal of the Old Testament situation in the blessings of the new. And filling out the thought, and filling out the, the thought that was begun there of, of this, this new relationship that, that is established as Israel comes forth from Egypt to Sinai and, and, and makes covenant and there is marriage and, and there is mutual avowals and so on. Uh, we have the, uh, the language in the rest of verse 17, which says, and, and she will answer there, she will give answer there, there in the wilderness at Sinai, I take it, she will give answer there as in the days of her youth, as in the days of her coming up, may Eretz, its Ryan from the land of Egypt. Uh, this is that other passage which we had in mind when we were asking what it meant about coming up from the land, remember? And we said that among the various options, uh, the one was to come up from the land of Egypt, and it was the, the parallel with this particular phrase uh, that uh, supported that. But here now the thought is that they're coming out of Egypt uh, there at, at Sinai, and the verb ana, the opening verb, which I translated, she will give answer. It also means to sing. Mm -hmm. So you, we have a choice here between ana to sing and ana to answer or to respond in some uh, mutual avowing. If it means to sing, what's the reference? Mm -hmm. She will sing to me there. I think you'd have to uh, think of Exodus 15 where after the deliverance from Egypt, when they went up from the land, they broke forth into that wonderful uh, song of praise of the Lord as the, the victorious one who has cast the Pharaoh and his chariots, horses into the depths of the sea. And uh, the song of Moses, the song by the sea, the song of Miriam, whatever name you want to give it, uh, that could be the occasion. And uh, God's people, therefore, will be singing the song of Moses and the Lamb, uh, Revelation 15, uh, that would be that kind of a thought under the new covenant. Or 
if it's ana, meaning to answer, to respond, then I think the thought is uh, that in the covenant making at Sinai, there is the mutual avowal. God says, I will take you as my covenant people. Israel, what will you do? And they say, all as the Lord has said, we will do. You know, they, they give their, their oath of allegiance. And so that would be the, the force of it, uh, as in the days of her youth, uh, when she came up from uh, the, the land of e Egypt. And uh, it's, uh, let me just finish uh, the, then the, 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 that 18th verse. And it shall be in that day, said the Lord, that you will call me is she, my husband. And here's part of the mutual avowal. Israel, who formerly would not acknowledge the Lord uh, properly, now will acknowledge him. Yes, uh, you are is she, my husband. And uh, she won't be uh, substituting the, the Baal gods for Yahweh, uh, but she will recognize Yahweh as her husband, and, and not sh will she be calling uh, me and any more Baal, uh, as it goes on to say, because God will be taking the names of the Baalim out of her mouth. Here, here is the removal of Baalism we spoke about, uh, in the sense now of, of purification. It's over against uh, frustration earlier on, and I must uh, leave it there and uh, finish off. And the, the third chapter then is the one that you might want to be thinking about and to, uh, how to handle. You see that problem of that. Uh, Reunion there, the reunion of Hosea and Gomer is used in order to depict uh, not the new covenant, uh, uh, but the, the judgment on uh, the old covenant.